Okay. Wow, that's really bright. How's that one there? Colour on here is very strange compared to. Ooh, do I look really, really glowy? That's odd. Is that better? Okay, share this video. I'm not going to timely. I want to see guest requests. Allow your viewers to request to join you. Yes. So I'm waiting for Sachin to come on. Who have I got there? Right, Claire's on. Hi, Claire. Let's see if I can get, bring them on camera. Hopefully, Sachin's going to come up any minute. Sachin, if you comment, then I can bring you on camera. I think I look a really strange colour. Do I look a weird colour? Or is it just my eyes? Because this light is phenomenally bright. Are you there, Sachin? So I'm bringing Sachin on live tonight just to answer a few questions about aesthetic injectables, um, which I get a lot of questions about from clients. And injectables work kind of hand in hand with what I do, um, and they kind of complement each other. Uh, I think a lot of people, they think that they would either have permanent makeup or beauty treatments, or they'd have they'd opt for the inje injectables or the more kind of um, invasive treatments. But actually, I always think that it, that it all works together. It all um, kind of works hand in hand, as I say. So I'm just waiting for Sachin to jump on, hopefully, so I can pull him in. Um, I might get him on the phone. Oh no, I can't, because I'm on the phone. <laughs> How annoying. Sachin, if you comment, then I can hopefully bring you in on camera. So basically, um, I can't remember how I met Sachin. I think it was via his lovely wife. Yeah, it was. So his lovely wife came to me um, for some treatments and we got talking about injectables and I started recommending a few of my clients to Sachin and then he was doing mine. Um, I got him in to do my Botox. I've had Botox for years um, and a lot of people will say to me you don't need it but actually I don't need it because I have it if that makes sense. Um, the thing that I, I got into having Botox because it was my GP I used to get really, there he is, I used to get really bad um, migraine, migraines now it doesn't say, it doesn't say invite him in on everybody else it says bring them in on camera. Why won't it say bring him in on camera? See if you can log in on your personal account Sachin rather than Surrey Aesthetica because that might be why it's not showing. Um, I think I look really tanned as well, I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not tanned. I don't know whether I've got a filter on. I don't think I have. Have I gone mad on the bronzer? I don't think I have. Ooh. How nice. I must come in here more often with this glowy light. Um, yeah, back to... So I went to the GP. I used to get really bad migraines from having meningitis. I think it was a start after effect of meningitis. Um, and I used to get like really bad tension headaches here and was on lots and lots of painkillers and going through all of these and taking quite a lot. And my GP just said off the record, and this was when I was about probably mid twenties, off the record, um, you might want to try Botox just in this area, just to relax these muscles. Cause it was kind of like a tension headache. So I kind of, I thought it was a lot of money and I didn't really know what to expect but I went to a GP, uh, a private GP and told him that I'd been recommended this and he started doing uh, just the relaxation sort of just to relax this muscle here 
and I never really looked back. Um, I kind of get this fold. Cosmetically, I get a fold here and because of bloody lockdown, I haven't had Botox probably for a, nigh on nearly a year now. Um, but when I frown, I get a, most people get frown lines coming up. Not me. I obviously buck the trend. Here's Sachin. Bring him in on camera. Come on. Bring Sachin. I normally get upward frown lines. Oh no, I don't get. It. There he is. How are you doing? Can you hear us? Hello, Sophia. Hi, Sachin. Yeah, not bad, not good. bad. Finally. Good, good. How are you? <laughs> I know. 20 minutes into the live and I finally get you on. <laughs> Technology. No, I, I think there was a problem with. I was using um, I was using my wife's laptop actually, um, and I realised I think there might be some issue with that. Um, and then obviously I just decided to come onto my phone, so now you're you're seeing me from my phone. Hopefully so the quality is good enough. So you're doing the manly thing of blaming the missus. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I'm blaming her using her laptop. Um, I think I find that I, I tend to use, I've got a desktop upstairs, but as I'll take it, it just wasn't going to work. <laughs> it was, wasn't it? You, you I think the angle. Was oh, was it? You keep um, breaking up a bit, so I don't know, is your Wi Fi, are you near your router? Are you no, on I'm 4G? No, I'm actually near my router. So let me just see if I can put this thing back in. And let's connect to the other network. Hopefully that should be a more stable connection. Okay, cool. So I was just explaining, just while um, you get yourself sorted, I was just explaining about my journey and where I started using Botox, for instance. So I was explaining that I used to get tension headaches here in the GP, rather than taking all the painkillers, the GP record, uh, recommended I have some, some just Botox to relax this muscle. And I was saying most mm -hmm. people get frown lines coming up, but I get this weird flap, my, yeah. my strange droop. Um, so when I have, I, I usually have the three areas now. So I started off here and then I started to get these lines. Um, mm -hmm. so then we, then I started to have your, you can explain later on bits, but I get work up here and then the dreaded crow's feet. So I get the three areas and that tends to be the most popular areas. But before we go down the yeah. technical route of everything and all of the ins and outs of Botox, Let's just now, I've got you on, start from the beginning and just give yourself a little um, introduction as in who you are and where you're from and stuff like that. So, um, I'm Sash, uh, full name Sachin Shukla. Um, I grew up in West London, quite near, near Oxbridge, if anybody knows kind of that area. Um, and I was pretty much born and bred around that area. Um, at 18, obviously, I went to study medicine. Um, initially, my plan was, or I really, I was quite keen, like a lot of students wanting to go really far away from home. Um, and I think initially I was quite keen on that, but then eventually I just ended up going to Imperial College, which is in West London, in Kensington. Um, was there for about six, six, seven years. Um, then ended up working around there, pretty much lived there. Uh, for so most did you of my always training. want to go into medicine? Is it something in the family or were you the first? Um, I think a lot of my family were actually more, my mum's family, a lot of them uh, were involved in business. And then my dad's family was a mixture of, of professions. But um, I don't think medicine, nobody else really was a doctor before, before me. Ah. Uh, and I've got a cousin now who's a dentist. And I think we've got a few more um in the extended family who are kind of going towards the, the the medical side but i would say most of my dad's family were involved in um were yeah i think my mom's family sorry were involved in business dads are quite mixed and very very international yeah. so um my interest really started um 
I think I used to read a lot. I, I was very keen on reading. I still tend to read read a lot, many hours, uh, all the time. You know, every or every day, I try to dedicate some time to it. Um, and I was always interested in science. And I remember when I was um, about fourteen, I watched a very interesting documentary about the. There was one very famous man whose name I can't remember, but he was hideously burnt during the Falklands War. Oh, Simon! This a, yeah, this was, a, this was a whole documentary about the yeah. reconstruction surgery that he had. And I just started thinking, I was thinking, wow, this is, this is really interesting stuff. Um, and I think that's what sparked my interest. And I was always, already gravitating towards the sciences anyway. Um, then my A-levels were pretty much kind of geared towards that. And okay. I ended up uh, going... going medicine. So did you want to specialise in a certain field in medicine? I think I think up till up till I was in medical school, most of my kind of most of my focus was on ENT surgery. So I uh, started a foundation training, which is like which is kind of called F1, F2. Um, and at the end of my F1, I kind of picked jobs that were relevant to uh, to ENT. I ended up doing that as an F2. I spent some time outside London. Um, but then I wanted a bit of a change. So I actually went and did a master's. So after my foundation training, I went to do a master's, um, did a master's, came back, and then I was working at, at St. Bart's in head and neck surgery. Um, and then a few other places before, you know, deciding on, on exactly what I wanted to do. I think over that time, what happened was that my, my interests also diverged. I kind of became interested in a lot of other things my master's by the way was very different from medicine it was in something quite different uh, at business school um and that was something which i was i was interested in i think yeah. it's very very i have passions um so in my spare time i've i've always loved doing calligraphy i play music um and i think that it's just you know very much something that that you know i think it's important to yeah. you know, broaden your horizon and then obviously having thing. like your business background and your family that takes you on to starting going into sort of your private medicine and kind of this whole business of sorry aesthetica and working yeah. for yourself but in medicine I think it was always something that i was interested in so um i had a friend who was very much involved in the beauty industry more generally she um ran her own spa and she always was quite encouraging saying that you should consider doing something like this and it didn't uh, initially i was thinking i was always busy with other things um and then when i started looking into it and just looking at, at the, the general quality that's out there uh it was quite shocked to be honest to see mm. how unregulated the industry was yeah. um and you know then you you kind of learn a bit more about what's actually going on uh how bad the standards actually yeah. are how how unmedicalized should i say yeah. these procedures come um this that is I, that my I... big thing this is when i was talking to Goshi, your wife when we first met um, and she asked me if i worked with anyone who did injectables and i yeah. all through my career i've always and i've kind of probably it doesn't go down too well in beauty because a lot of therapists will train up to sort of their beauty therapy level kind of six level sevens and they mm -hmm. consider themselves on par with medics and i've always been very anti beauticians doing injectables and it's not that mm -hmm. i don't think that they've got the ability or the knowledge but you guys medics have got the support of the royal colleges and the insurances mm -hmm. behind you and mm -hmm. from i think from a consumer's point of view from a client's point of view if something went wrong, you need your therapist to be able to deal with the consequences, whereas mm -hmm. therapists, yeah. so you would need somebody to be able to prescribe an antidote or prescribe something, a way out of a problem, whereas a therapist has to rely on a medic to get their prescription. So I tended to, I found out, I found that therapists tend to charge more because they're paying uh, somebody to do the prescribing, they're paying somebody to do all of that medical side of things, and then they are then taking that. And get, so you're kind of missing out the middleman by going straight to the medic, I think. Yeah, I think I think it, it, it's 
I think, first of all, there, there's a very big market. Um, there's a very big underground market, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and I think in our kind of conversations in the past, I've kind of told you about the difference between toxins, which are considered the medicine. So things like Botox, Azaleur, Bocature, these are examples of essentially the same toxin that's used to paralyze muscles. So yeah. what people commonly call Botox, the treatment Botox, relies on this particular toxin that we derive from bacteria that come from the soil. Okay. Um, very, very, very potent toxin. Um, it can cause, make people very ill. Typically people like rugby players who roll around in the mud, they can get you know, they can get poisoned by, by this, simply by the toxin so this that comes is one from the of my, This was actually one of my questions, like, we've jumped ahead a bit, but mm -hmm. one of the questions I got through was, what is Botox? Because a lot of people are under the misconception that Botox might be a snake venom. So just let us, t tell us a bit more about what Botox actually is and what it does to us. Yeah, Botox essentially is a toxin that comes from bacteria this bacteria normally lives in the soil um, there are different types of the toxin that the bacteria produces or different types of toxin that might be produced by different types of bacteria but essentially it is a toxin that paralyzes muscles okay so when a person um, develops toxicity from from this bacteria when they're let's just say rolling around in the mud and something gets into a wound they will develop um, paralysis of the muscles that's how it actually kills people so people again like a lot of a lot of good things in in medicine we actually study bacteria that are doing things um like i'll give you the example of of, of antibiotics antibiotics often um, come from understanding how one bacteria suppresses another bacteria to get an advantage right. so and when we started studying this, we realized the whole of this is actually very, very good for paralyzing muscles. Um, and then we started using it for things like, um, let's just say bladder um, issues that people would have very, very hyperactive bladder. Yeah. Uh, we, would start, we started using this toxin to paralyze the bladder, not entirely to a certain extent and get benefit there. Uh, then it was used, something which I remember from my from my ENT time, um, is that you would actually use it in vocal cords as well. If you want to paralyze one vocal cord to try and get things working better, you can do that there. Eventually, we realized that this has uses in, in cosmetic applications when done properly. Um, and when you do it, you can actually paralyze muscles strategically so that you actually enhance the aesthetic effect overall. Okay. Uh, and also stop the aging process which is another benefit um, a lot of younger patients want to come now and they they don't want the full dose but they want really just a relaxing of the process yeah. so in 10 years 12 years the deep lines that typically would that would, that would form um, don't form as much or can almost sometimes even be completely eliminated yeah. uh, so it's a more of a, a prevent it's, it's I think people are catching on and realizing that you know, even doing um, sub doses early on, which means smaller doses yeah. to begin with, you can kind of get a good effect um, later on when you're in your mid to late thirties. Can you have too much Botox? I I don't think you can get too much Botox um, because I mean the way that it's formulated is it just stays where it is. Um, I, if you say that, you know, if, if I were to give double dose in, into a certain area, once you know what the optimal dose is, so um, I'll, I'll go back to what good practice is in terms of treating someone uh, later on. But once you know what the optimal dose is, that is the dose that they need to, uh, to get the best realistic effect and also have the longest lasting effect, injecting more probably won't do very much. Okay. Um, I so think it, like, it, it will go to a certain point and then it just gets wasted. Like yeah. vitamin C, yeah. you take a certain amount and then the rest just goes. Well, the thing is, the thing that you need to remember with Botox is the way that it works is where you have nerves. So the big nerves become smaller and smaller and smaller until they get to a point where they are sticking into the muscle. So at those really really fine junctions where the nerves the really fine nerves are actually going straight into the muscle that's where botox works okay. if you inject botox onto a big nerve let's just say the big nerve that comes into your face the facial nerve directly onto the nerve, it actually doesn't do anything okay it won't 
any effect. It works what we call what the neuromuscular junction is, which is the really fine point where a nerve connects to the muscle and nowhere else. So once you've paralyzed all of the area, all of, the, all of that area which, where the nerves are connected to the muscle, putting more in there won't paralyze it anymore. It's already paralyzed. Yeah. So at that point, you're not getting any additional benefit um, because you've already, what we would say, saturated the, the receptors there and it just won't work anymore. So I don't think you can have too much Botox. Fillers, a different story, but um, Botox, you know, if you stick to roughly what the dose for the patient is, then you, you'll, you'll get the same result, really. And how long does it last? Okay, good question. Um, we, as a roundabout, I would say uh, three months, um, three to four months on average. Um, the first time I see a patient, I will say to them that it should last around about three months. Now, you do get cases where people really break down the toxin really well uh, or really build up the receptors, build new receptors up very quickly. Um, and in those situations, you can get a lower limit of around about two months. Some people find that, you know, it starts to wear off after two months. It might be annoying for them. Um, they, they tend to be in a minority, but I have seen that some people get a, a shorter duration and some people can, can really go for six months and not need yeah. any more. So, you know, I think as a roundabout kind of figure, I tend to say that Botox uh, or similar such treatments will last about three months. Um, and I normally touch base with them uh, or they normally contact me to say, look, you know, it's starting yeah. to wear off now. What do you think I should do? And then we can just build a plan together. Do, really. you, prefer from, um, do you prefer to keep up? So keep going every three months and do it regularly? Or is there a problem with it? completely and just doing like once every couple of years or special occasions is it better to keep topping I think, up i i think with i think with toxin treatments it really is um it's much much better to just keep to a schedule um because i think the effect that you get with it really begins to show after a few years of of keeping on top of things like just like clockwork every three three and a half months you go and you have your treatment you stay on top of everything it really changes the skin contours and the formation of lines over that period so even patients who've got relatively troubling deep lines if you keep on top of treatment with Azalure or Botox or Bopatrol, what you'll find is that after, her, after about 18 months to two years, even those lines will start to fade. They might not entirely go That's away. just you're... with Botox. Just with Botox, yeah. Because what will happen is that the elasticity of the skin, because your skin really starts to lose elast elasticity when it's constantly moving. And simply by giving it that break, it allows the skin to just get back to where it was um doesn't form the lines doesn't form the the, the deep the pigmented yeah. areas and all that stuff that typically comes from just repeated use really and from so my point of view there are treatments so i will say to a client who's got very lined skin that i would say to them go to get the botox or go to get their filler but then there are treatments that I do, like dermaplaning, which mm -hmm. will remove all the dead skin. And I tend to find the dead skin that sits within those creases, those very mm -hmm. creased lines. Once you really exfoliate those out and you're having the Botox and possibly the filler as well, which is what I was saying mm -hmm. right at the beginning about working hand in hand with beauty. Mm -hmm. So people yes. are replacing me to come to you. They're no. kind of getting the, both, the best of both worlds and yeah, still exactly. both of us. I think, I think, I think skin, the superficial skin. Um, so I, the way that I look at it, I don't deal with the superficial skin as such. The actual surface of the skin is not My something <laughs> that yeah, I don't deal with. That that's your job. Yeah. Um, I can deal with the muscles. I can, can deal, deal with the with workings underneath. Yeah, all that the 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 work with the symmetry even. Um, there are a lot of things that you can do with with the substructure, as I would say, yeah. uh, but the actual superficial structure, the actual quality of yeah. the skin. Of course, that requires a, a slightly different what perspective, and I think that that's what what uh, what you do, and yeah. I think my wife's very happy as well. <laughs> so, are there any kind of is there any aftercare that people need to do or to keep up with? So, for instance, do is it best to have Botox and then not 
moisturize or not massage or are there things that they should do or products that they could use not really well i think with botox there's a there's a general advice that i'll give afterwards you know things that like things which are associated with bruising risk so hypothetically there is an off chance that alcohol might make bruising worse so we typically say look just try to stay off alcohol today um it's probably best not to fiddle around with the skin too much um just let the just let the product settle yeah. in or the medication into the muscle um again really just from a bruising perspective you don't want if there's a if there's a a blob of botox under your skin you want it to stay where it is you don't want it to migrate no. anywhere else so um, from my point of view i would say to someone who comes to me for facials um that if they're planning on having botox their last facial would be kind of two three days before you seeing mm -hmm. you and then i normally say to them leave it two weeks until you come back to me to let their yeah. botox settle in and it's the same when it comes to permanent makeup so if i was going to do somebody's eyebrows one of our questions is um are you planning on or do you have botox um sometimes i'll have people come for a consultation and they they're really asymmetrical so they've got one brow lower than the other so they'll come to me to get that fixed and i nine mm -hmm. times out of ten it's muscular so they'll especially in this day and age for some reason it's this selfie thing so these girls will turn <laughs> to one side and they'll do one eyebrow and then that becomes mm -hmm. their prominent eyebrow so they get this one yeah. lift and this one stays down and then they come to me and say can i tattoo that eyebrow up with that one and i'll say uh -huh. it's more muscular than it is brow so yeah. i will then give them your number for you mm -hmm. to fix the muscle for me to then tattoo two lovely symmetrical eyebrows. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I would say to them, if somebody's planning on having Botox or regularly has Botox, I would say have your eyebrows tattooed at least two weeks before or two weeks after. Mm -hmm. um, and then aftercare wise, on my, from my point of view, when it comes to bruising after having any cosmetic injectables, the LED Dermalux light is brilliant for um, mm -hmm. just the pit the healing process and it really speeds up healing so if If we had a clinic together and we both work together I would be saying to I would be saying to your clients have your Botox and then come straight in for a half an hour lamp treatment or mm -hmm. If they're planning on having their Botox right now, they can hire the Dermalux la lamp and they can have their Botox and then do the lamp at home for a period of a few days afterwards just to help them heal up. Yeah, yeah. So it works Sounds really like... well hand in hand. So what mm -hmm. other treatments apart from Botox? Okay, so the the other treatments, obviously the big treatments, um, in fact the, the, the bulk of the treatments uh, are with dermal fillers. Um, and again, I think dermal fillers have evolved quite a bit. Um, over the years, I think a lot of people have hesitations about dermal fillers, thinking that, oh, I really don't want, you know, anything because they have these ideas from, from when they first came out, which were permanent dermal fillers, um, and there were some hideous complications back then. Most of the more modern products that are on the market, uh, they are hyaluronic acid based, oh, okay. which is a which is a normal component of your skin. So essentially what they've done is they've created a product which is formed from something that you already have in your yeah. skin. You put more of it in and its function really is, is hydration. So it, it tends to draw water in um, and that's what gives the volume. Different types of products for different areas and different depths and, and different things that you can do. There's quite a large portfolio of, of different products that are out there. Um, and Again, I think most of the artistry really comes with with fillers. I think there's a lot yeah. more there's a lot more involved in putting the right amount in the right places and trying to work with symmetry. And um, I would say technically, it, it's there's a lot more there. So I think the bulk of the treatments really. So do you are, have a do you use certain types of filler for certain types of patients? So are there so 
if, is it somebody who's got very deep lines that would have the dermal filler and then somebody who wants more natural look would go with the, the hyaluronic acid ones? Well, the, derm well, the dermal fillers are the, the hyaluronic acid pretty much is all the, all the fillers that are out there, oh, okay. really. I think the old fashioned permanent um, fillers don't really get used very much. They're just not, they're, they're not worth the risk, to be honest. But these are the too ones many... that you get these, um, the big, so when they have the massive lips and they'll get these lumps and then they have to have these <laughs> surgical lumps, they have to have them removed and cut yeah. out. Is that the old type? I think, I think you might be thinking about the, the old fashioned yeah. ones. These when days. You get Leslie Ash. Yeah, yeah, I think I think I know who you're talking about. Massive um, lips, <laughs> big, big, yeah, kind of back when it first started. Um, you don't use those anymore. The ones which you use now, in the worst case scenario, if something were to go wrong, uh, you can dissolve it quite easily using a medication which um, you should have in your bag. So uh, when so you say you should have, only mm -hmm. a doctor can prescribe that medication. Yes, which is my yes. argument about therapists doing filler. Therapists mm -hmm. or anyone who can't prescribe won't be able to yeah. carry that medicine around. And when no, you talk about no. prescriptions, um, anyone who does Botox or f is it filler as well that needs to filler? Does that need to be prescribed to each patient or is that? No, no. So the filler does, but the antidote for it. Yeah, this is a very, very a very big issue um, amongst aesthetic doctors um, and it's something which a lot of people have been campaigning for to change because on balance um, you have the toxins I think as we were talking about which are considered the medicine yeah. uh, and every patient that you treat you have to be in a position to be able to prescribe it for that patient. Fillers on the other hand are considered a medical device okay. which means anybody can buy them you actually have you can go online you can buy them um the skill really comes in terms of you know what you're actually paying for is the skill of the practitioner in being able to inject and, and the safety side of things and treating it as a medical procedure if i were to give you a kind of balance between what i think is a more risky procedure it's definitely filler um, yeah much yeah. much more risky um I mean, the, first of all, let, let me just let me just clarify this. They are extremely, extremely safe, especially the modern the, the modern fillers, and you know, done properly, knowing where the anatomy is and everything. They are exceedingly safe. Um, there is a small risk, as I said, of having like an anaphylactic anaphylactic reaction. I think you mentioned um, earlier. Uh, there's a, a small, very, very small risk of also having a kind of regional reaction. But these are very, very small risks that, you know, most people don't need to, to think very kind of in depth about. Mm. They're there. It needs to be mentioned here at the beginning. So when you have, really... if, you went for a, if you went for any of your treatments, you always do a consultation beforehand and you go through medical <laughs> history. So is there anyone who shouldn't have Botox or fillers? Like, is there a... a are there certain people that you would say in the consultation going through it and say, sorry, you're, that would be too risky for you? Um, Contraindication well, I, wise. I think with, with fillers, you have to be in a position where you think that the tissue can actually take the filler and where they want it. So if I have an older patient coming in, um, I would probably put a much thinner if you wanted something quite superficial to the skin i would probably want to put something um quite thin not as thick because i don't think that the tissue itself would necessarily take a very thick filler okay. and because of the skin being quite thin it might become quite visible so you need to have that realistic conversation with with someone who's older and you know i have patients who come to me now you know, some are in their 70s and they want slightly fuller lips and you know they want a very subtle look they don't want anything just too obvious but you know, age-related um thinning of, of the of the tissue but but you know they still live very active lives and yeah. and, and i'm there to support um so i think there is as i said this um you know the, the uh the consultation side and figuring out the right product for the for the right patient is also then you know having a kind of realistic expectation of, of what you can and cannot achieve um 
So I think that's that's one thing which again so a lot you know, of you, people were up, really, a lot of questions that came through were the whole thing of how they were put off filler because they were worried about it going lumpy or some of the girls look like cats they go cat like <laughs> why would that yeah. happen this is again this is what what I, what I what I was saying earlier that um kind of coming back to my point that um th there are just a lot of um there, there are a lot of people who will just inject whatever um, out there because, because as I said, you don't need any qualification. You don't. You can buy these products online. Um, you don't necessarily care about about the risk side of things. You don't explain that. Um, and uh, you know, things like going into lips with a plain needle is just a very, very risky procedure. Um, going into the body of the lip with with a plain needle. Is, a, is very, very high risk. And anybody who understands that would typically use a, use something like a cannula, which makes it, which, which is, is which wobbly. makes it, it's kind of more flexible, yeah, which, which doesn't have a sharp end. Um, but again, if you don't do it properly, you can end up with just injecting, you know, the wrong amounts, you don't have some control, you can end up giving these, you know, very, you can overfill things very easily. Okay. Um, some people will like that look. Um, I think there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of very young patients out there. Is who it actually the fact want, that once you start, you can't stop kind of thing? And it you does work, happen. You get clients coming back for more and more and more. And I it, want them bigger and bigger and does, bigger. It does happen. I think people are advertising now Russian lips and yeah. various things along those lines. Um, I try to avoid doing things that don't necessarily, you know, I, I, I think I think within within reason you can you can look at someone's expectation and say, look, I can do this. But at the same time, you don't want to be just injecting what, whatever somebody thinks they need. It's a bit like doing any medical work in hospital. You can't, you know, you, you have to have a, a line where you say, actually, anything more than this is probably going to be, you know, it's gonna, you're, you're going to start putting yourself exposed to, yeah. to risks. I think we've had do, this discussion before because you and I have got similar mindset where we are all about natural beauty mm -hmm. and natural enhancements but we're not afraid to say no i'm the same with my clients if my client if i had a client walk in and they were showing me big black sharpie pen eyebrows i do yeah. not have an issue with saying sorry no i'm not doing it. i'm not putting mm -hmm. my name to it um because yeah. I want my sure. clients to walk out of here and I want people to look natural. They're a walking advert for me. Um, so yeah. it doesn't, it, I have no problem with saying no to people and they're quite welcome to go somewhere else. And I think yeah. we've had that discussion where you're the same, you know, less is more. And I'd rather them go mm -hmm. away and then come back in two or three months time and say, could I just have a little bit more? And then you say, you don't need it actually. <laughs> I, 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 I fully agree. I think, I think if you want to maintain your professionalism, you have to work to a certain standard yourself. Yeah. And, it, and that, that needs to be in your own mind. You need to have this. And I think this coming from a, from a, from a medical background where I was used to consenting patients and for procedures and everything, um, there is definitely that side where, you know, you're, you have to manage their, what you can and cannot achieve. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's so much that you can do, these days and with, this, with the portfolio products that are available and with the skills that, that, that you have putting it together in conjunction with some of the things that I do. Um, I think there's, there's so much that you can do, but, but there are people, as I said, you know, who um, uh, maybe just need a bit more kind of nudging in the right direction yeah. in terms of what you achieve. And I think that, you know, being professional is, is about being honest. Yeah. About that. And I think that's, that's what I try to do. Um, yeah, definitely. If, so I have I had a couple of questions that people fired yeah, at me. So if you're happy, um, one of the main questions that people came through, especially about fillers, was do they hurt? Have you had fillers, uh, Sachin? Do you, have you had them yourself? Do you know the answer? No, to this no, question? I haven't. <laughs> no, I have. But I, I did recently get some Botox in my jaw um, because I grind my teeth. So. Oh, does it help uh, with that? Yeah. 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 So I, mean, it, I know it, that Botox, it, but, but then pain is a very personal thing, and I've I can take pain, whereas uh -huh. yeah, 
I can't even pluck one hair out of my husband's eyebrow without him screaming. This big butch <laughs> fireman that he is. <laughs> I can't, he's too scared of I think tweezers. Generally have lower pain thresholds than women. It's kind of Do you work with many men? I have done. I have worked with a few, yeah. Um, it's not as many as, as women. But, but Botox um, and for filler. Um, yes, there is a, there is, you know, there are patients who come in. Um, I try to tell most men that, that you should keep your crow's feet because it really does enhance their, yeah. their looks. Um, some people want a completely smooth look, yeah. but again, it's part of my honesty that um, I think all the research shows that crow's feet make men look more attractive, not less. Um, so it's, uh, I it's something which I... <laughs> So the question was, do they hurt? So what about fillers? Because I remember us having um, a conversation and you said, is there, there's anaesthetic or topical anaesthetic in the syringe, isn't there? Yeah, the, the syringe itself normally contains, well, it, it does contain lidocaine, which is, a, which is an anaesthetic that we pretty much use all the time yeah. in hospital. It's what you use when you're stitching things up. It's already got lidocaine within the gel. So there are measures that you can use to try and numb the skin. I find that in some places, um, things are going to be a bit more sensitive, shall I say. So anywhere around the mouth, you have to be careful um, with, with, with pain, maybe put some cream on beforehand. Yeah, I, do the cream on before. I, I typically use a, a small amount of ice as well for the first one. And what you'll find is that after the first injection, so with, let's just say with the lip, you will typically do the border um the the actual border of the lip first um, is that the most painful all... bit yeah but once you've actually gone in um you've already put some anesthetic in yeah. so the second and third typically will will always be a lot more numb than than going in into the first one yeah. and then once you've done the border the body of the lip again is already got anesthetic in it so it's not too bad but you know it it, it does involve needles um it does as i say does involve so most of the work that i do is done with a cannula which is a slightly more advanced technique than going in just with a needle it means that you you know you have a much better safety margin and um and that tends to be blunt but the first needle as i say you know you are going to feel something i wouldn't lie to you and say that no. it doesn't but most people tolerate it quite well with the measures that you can take cool um another question i think you tapped on earlier on one of um, my followers messaged and said that one of her friends had anaphylactic reaction to the filler um and in uh -huh. your experience are therapists prepared or qualified to be able to deal with a reaction and would it be there and then that you dealt with it or is it a matter that they would have to go somewhere yeah very very good question again um Anaphylaxis, uh, let me just clarify what anaphylaxis actually is. So um, somebody might get stung by a bee um, and have a, a local reaction to it. So they might have some redness around there. They might end up with a rash. Something that's more prominent than just the sting itself, you might say that they've had an allergic reaction to it. Um, anaphylaxis is the extreme case where your entire body will respond to something that it's been exposed to. Your blood pressure will drop and various other things will start to happen. It really is what we would say a systemic everything in the body. Now in that situation, what you need to do uh, is you need to support their, their circulation. So their blood pressure. And the way that you do that is you give adrenaline or an EpiPen straight away. You so can most people- that. Yes, yes. We, so, Again, it's a prescription only medicine. Um, there's been a shortage in the world um, of, of actually the, the, the pens that we would use with the correct dose for anaphylaxis. Um, so a lot of, lot of people um, who can have had to actually carry around adrenaline and they need to know how to formulate it and everything and how much to give. Um, I, as I said, it's very, very, very rare. Um, yeah. I've, never had, I've never even had a, an allergic reaction to 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 a, a dermal filler because you know that they're, they're they're very very heavily how would tested. you know if they're having if you were having this sort of a reaction is it quite instant or is it a matter that a client would go home and then experience no what, what are the symptoms no. of it have a you would have a reaction so um i would probably look at the the local area you'd, you'd probably see some sort of a response locally um and then you would start to 
you would see what you I'd look for what you'd describe as as kind of systemic, um, feeling light handed, possibly collapsing. Um, you know, you'd have to check their pulse. And if I think for whatever reason that their that the, you know their 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 blood pressure is is low, um, and they're not perfusing properly, I would give adrenaline first. And this goes anywhere even in your hospital or something if you think something like that is happening and you think that that might be the case um you will give adrenaline first and think about everything afterwards so just um, backtracking a bit because that this is quite scary to actually listen yeah. to but this is exactly why when i say to my clients i would only recommend a doctor perform procedures like injectables and a lot mm -hmm. of therapists will do this treatment but I personally, I take mm -hmm. it upon myself to only recommend to my clients yeah. the people that I know will look after them. Now, I didn't touch at this touch this subject at the beginning of this conversation, but you're actually an A and E doctor who works for mm -hmm. the National Health. So, mm -hmm. in my eyes, my recommendation for them to come to you is more about your experience in how to deal with things that might go wrong than it is necessarily mm -hmm. to deal with the actual. The actual skill of injecting um, and that's yeah. where I'm quite happy to refer my clients to you as opposed to a therapist mm -hmm. who doesn't have this experience yeah I, th I think I, I, I think at the the onset when I said that these are medical procedures yeah. uh, and they do involve drugs so yeah Botox line is a drug that you need to prescribe um, as I said, I think I think on the balance of things, Botox is a lot more heavily regulated because it's classed as a medication. Yeah, and you have to have that prescribed, um, and they can't. Yeah, and you I, get a little bottle; it's got your name as a patient on it, and you can't share that around to other patients, can you? It's only for them. No, no. Okay. Um, another question yeah. and a client has had is that she broke her nose as a when she was younger, and it, she's now mm -hmm. got a lump in her nose. So, can filler fix? The, the lump in her nose it depends on it depends on how how severe the break was um and what exactly is required there are procedures that you can do with filler um you can do a non-surgical rhinoplasty as it's called where you can inject filler to try and remove or lessen the appearance of a bump um but if the if there is a lot of deviation of the bone uh, and also often what you'll tend to find is that the septum will go which is the cartilage in the middle of the nose because kind of to one side alongside a break in the bone then i would if you really are bothered by that then i would probably consider you know getting some of the bone shaved away and the, and the cartilage reset which is called this formal, would be a right. nose job this would be it, it by a plastic surgeon it, it it would uh probably an ent yeah ent or plastic ent are probably better for that okay. um they, they kind of know a bit more about you know um the function side of things but i think that um yeah you know it, it a lot of the times it, it depends I, I i did some work in in london with a very prominent um um you know surgeon who, who worked with that and he uh you know a lot of the times people you know they can't breathe properly yeah. as a result of a broken nose so you know it's not just about it's not just about what 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 it looks like um, there's often a, a you know a functional side as you say that they can't breathe properly and you know they need the procedure for that so yeah. who's to say that they they shouldn't have that um you know on that basis so just kind of sum things up and figure out exactly what you need but there are things as i said that you can do with filler um and then there are things that you can do with surgery yeah and uh yeah. and the another question was from a client who's had um now she actually approached me when i started doing the plasma um skin tightening treatment yeah and she was she's basically got one eyebrow that's that it's more muscular when she came for consultation it was kind of like it was a, a lazy eye just this eye mm -hmm. one eyebrow was a much lower like i say and it was kind of when she lifted her eyebrows, this one was just, there was not much muscle movement there at all. So I mm -hmm. said to her, she was hoping that 
she's kind of experienced it more in the eyelid, but I actually recognized it to be the muscle that wasn't lifting the lid, than it mm -hmm. actually was this heavy lid. Um, so yeah. I said to her, I referred her to Botox, to have Botox, and then once she's had the Botox and lifted that, that muscle, mm -hmm. then I'd look at do the, doing the plasma skin yeah. tightening yeah. to obviously tighten up that skin if she needed it. So is that, mm -hmm. was I right in doing that, do you think? I mean, obviously yeah. you haven't seen yeah. her particular case, but there, do you find there, that you get somebody, can you just work on one side or would you do both and even it out, do a bit, what, how would that work if you had well, one? There, there, are, there, are, there are two ways you can look at this. You can say, well, actually you've got an asymmetry in brow lift um, and it could be that you you actually weaken the other side to bring it down. Oh, okay. okay. If, if the eyebrows already lifted quite well but if you find that she's quite happy with the other side and where it sits then there are things that you can do just to lift that eyebrow um, and it all depends on which muscle you go for so um, again it's a slightly more unusual treatment but it's something which which i've done where you you inject in a specific place just in the eyebrow itself and that will lift it up um, and of course, you have to be very careful if you don't know what dose they need. So you probably want to make it incremental, maybe over over a couple of sessions, just to make sure it's just right. Yeah. Because um, obviously, I think people tend to notice each other's eyes quite a bit. Uh, so you don't want to, you know, yeah. uh, you mess things up there. So yeah, but it's it's very very possible that yeah. you can just work on try and get it more symmetrical with the and other. another lady um she said that she had botox years ago and they did too much and it ended up that her eyebrows drooped okay and then they tried to correct it and it made it worse and so it can she can got completely put off by the whole injectables because she ended up with really having had the botox yeah. to lift they ended up drooping does that is that something that you've heard of um, I think I know what probably happened. They probably put too much into the forehead. Um, well, you, the, the reason that you do the three areas together, so if you just treat, let's just say, the middle part, typically you leave the top, it'll tend to lift everything up. Um, so you need to try and balance that by treating the forehead as well, and that lifts it down. Sometimes what happens, however, is that, as I said, you know, if you've treated just the forehead you can get one side which comes up and this is why especially the first time um having a two-week review is quite a good idea so that you can kind of know tweak. exactly where you need to tweak things yeah. that record and then you have that for next time yeah that's quite common it's, it's again quite well understood but i i think that getting the dosing right for a, for a patient is is very important because as i said people are different the amount of muscle they have in their face is different some people have much more muscle in the middle yeah. other people have a lot more muscle higher up in their forehead their skull shapes will be different um the size of their forehead will be different yeah. so you need to bear all of this stuff in mind and just realize that actually you know i think the standard that that you will be taught um uh, you know, on your one day course that people might go to is very different from the reality of yeah. treating hundreds. And that's um, similar to, and, yeah, it's similar to, it's kind of, you get taught how to do it, but you don't learn the skill until you're actually working with no, patients all no. the time and you know skin. Um, so what about other, so we've spoken over the, over the years that we've known each other about different things like the threads. So threading, uh, mm -hmm. is that, are these things that you've done or are these plans for the future? Do you think you'll go? These that? are, these are more, these are more plans for the future. Um, not to, you know, I think that the, the requirements in terms of where and where you cannot do these treatments yeah. vary. Um, and I think in, 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 in a few years, as things change, as my business evolves, um, it might be something that, that, you know, I get involved with. Um, but again, from my perspective, I, I want to give the best treatments. I want to give things that I know will work. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I will be offering things that I know are in the best interest of my patients, yeah. uh, my clients. Um, and if I think that something is, you know, an average treatment, I'll probably, I'll, I'll just be honest and say, look, there are better ways of, of going about mm -hmm. this. And even if that means, you know, referring on for, for surgery or, or various yeah. things, I don't mind. 
And we've always talked about honest. working together. It would be really, I'd love to have a clinic and kind of work alongside you because there's things like I'm going to get into micro needling and then yeah. you can kind of bring in the, the medical peels. But I wouldn't mm -hmm. dream of doing the medical peel side of things. Yeah. But that's, we've always talked about that's something that you, could yeah. work, you would bring in. And it would just be mm -hmm. really nice to have the two kind of merge together and overlap, Working as together. it were. Yeah, yeah. There's I mean, lots I've, and lots of treatments that, that kind of do cross over. There are, yeah, there are a lot of, there's a, it's a very exciting area, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, a lot of development that's going on. Um, there was a product which uh, I learned about called PRXT33, which is like a pill, but it's not really a pill because it tends to get absorbed into the sub layer of skin and, and it tightens everything. They're very, very good treatment. Um, like it myself, I've had it done myself. Um, but again, it's just more a matter of rolling these yeah. things out. And the right Having time, the right place. We've always talked about yeah. working in, in a CQC. I want to get a CQC registered clinic. So that's yeah. kind of future plans that we've got um, that are there on the back burner. But thanks to the bloody yeah. pandemic. So touching <laughs> on what, so what's been life, what life, what have you been doing kind of during the pandemic since damn COVID came along? Yeah. I think it's... Um... Well, the first lockdown happened, and I think, like a lot of other people, I, I, I just didn't know what was going on. Even I don't think medic. anybody, <laughs> even as a medic, nobody knew. Everyone was very frightened. I think even medics were very frightened. We didn't really know what we were dealing with. Um, in hospital, I know that people were petrified, and you know, we didn't know how fast this thing would spread. I think after about a month or two, we, we realized exactly what we were dealing with. Um, so when did you see you were obviously in A and E? When mm -hmm. did you see your first kind of COVID patient? I must have seen. I have. If I were to hazard a guess, I think I saw a patient who probably had COVID even before it was declared. Yeah, in the I've country. heard this so many times. I, I, there, there, there are certain telltale signs of COVID, and I can explain one of them, is just how well people actually look. Um, people can have just the most awful numbers, but they can be sitting there having conversations with you. Yeah. But when you, when you look at their numbers, you think, how are you still alive? Now, when you say, I know what looking at their numbers means, because mm -hmm. I've been in hospitals so many times, I know your jargon, but yeah. for a layman, you mean kind of their pulse, their oxygen? The, the two things that I'm, I'll, I'll pay specific um, attention to are the, the sats, the saturations, what, how much their, what the saturation level of oxygen in their blood is. It's something which has become quite common now. A lot of people know this term because they've been buying pulse oximeters yeah. for home. <laughs> and it, it normally shows 98, 99, 100. These, these are good numbers. Um, with COVID, something very bizarre happens that people go, um, they become, they, they, their sats will sometimes go down to 70% and, uh, and these numbers are really, really bad. So the two things that we tend to look at is one, the saturation would give you a broad idea of how much oxygen there is in their blood. But to get a really detailed understanding of what's going on in their blood, you have to get an arterial sample of blood which means that you have to go here and get a uh, get, go, go into the artery and get that. Um, and I've seen people with, you know, um, oxygen levels, which until then you'd think how, you know, how on earth are you still alive, um, let alone having a conversation, but they were. And I think when it first happened, we, we, we didn't quite understand. I think a lot of people were unnecessarily at that point, unfortunately, were ventilated in ITU. Um, and I think that, that that in itself was probably, as we learned as the pandemic went on, we realised that that was not the best treatment for them. That when a lot of these patients. The ventilator put down into their air. So is this when CPAP it, a bet? Is that the alternative would be this CPAP that they talk about? Yeah. So the way that it's broken down is that you put them on oxygen and then you see where their oxygen levels are. If they can maintain their oxygen levels with with oxygen, that's fine. If they're not maintaining 
oxygen levels um, with plain old oxygen at, at the highest level that you can give it, then you think about CPAP. And then, of course, you, you have to be um, in a position where if that's not working, you have to think about doing things like mechanical ventilation and ITU. The trouble is, though, that um, it takes a certain age and a certain physiological quality of person to tolerate ventilation. Yeah. Uh, you know, if the reason that we don't give general anaesthetics to 85 year olds is very simple, it's because you know that if you give them a general anaesthetic, they'll never wake up. You'll never be able to get them around again. Yeah. So the same thing that with ventilation, you essentially put them into a coma from which yeah. they'll never wake up. So I mean, it's, I, it's a very who's who's had yeah. you know i was put into I, I, an induced coma i remember yeah. them taking it out i remember waking up because they were trying to get me awake yeah. um, and bring me round before i could even breathe for myself so i remember them taking the machine out and then quickly mm -hmm. having to be put back on it again and that happened two or three yeah. times to me um yeah but i've got a couple of friends who are itu nurses actually one mm -hmm. who probably took that machine out of me because she she was a friend of mine from when i was ill and she's still on yeah. ITU now wendy um but she um she she herself has been saying the same as you it's just and the age of people you've gone from having mainly the majority of elderly which was the first lockdown and then this one she said she had a 19 year old in you know and she he was on the news actually recently been interviewed um but she was saying how she said the same thing like they seem quite healthy um yeah and this guy this 19 year old i said to her he didn't look like he should have been in itu he didn't look as, as yeah. if he was that ill and she was like he was uh -huh. really ill but it went it went on twitter like what the hell's wrong with him there's nothing wrong with him he's chatting away playing his playstation yeah fine but the guy, like you said, had these stat sats that were through the floor. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, as I said, it's been a bit of a bit of a roller coaster of a year in terms of how much we've learned about this. Um, and at the same time, you kind of feel sorry for the patients who who came in at the beginning, because we simply didn't it's know. Bad wasn't you know now we know you know you can give steroids you can give various other things we know what works what doesn't work yeah. and patients are but when the pandemic first started everyone was thinking okay we just need to try our best and and figure things out and you know fortunately now we know a lot more about it we have we have a whole kind of you know portfolio of vaccines which are coming on um and i really can't emphasize this enough i think that the vaccines are really it's our way out changing things in a big way um so yeah i've had my first first shot so have you um, had I'll, have you did you contract covid do you have you had it well i i haven't i haven't had covid you can no catch it. I, i've i've certainly not had the symptoms for covid um i was at one point planning to get antibody tests and a lot of my colleagues who've had antibody tests have come back positive they've had it uh, but they were so they, they had it silently um and again i think that the way i look at it i think a lot of people have probably been exposed in healthcare and the ones who were going to become unwell did become unwell and pretty much everyone else has been exposed the antibody levels again are a marker um, but they don't give you the full picture of whether you're immune or not because there are a lot of other components of the immune system which which are also there some of it which is kind of stays in, in the memory of your immune system so you, you you do have immunity but it's just not as visible yeah. as as you might do you have so, your vaccine do you when you go for the vaccine because obviously our, the younger people we're not going to get yeah. until probably the summer so do you know when you have your vaccine which one we're going to get so like can you ask the question is it the astrazeneca is it the pfizer you, you you can probably ask for it i think that that information will be given to you i don't think there'll be any choice in which one you get i think everybody knows about the whole political situation um there's just a lot of there's a lot of political nonsense really crap i, I can't believe it's actually going on at a time like this but it is it might change um what happens with the vaccine i the last thing that i heard was that that belgium was not going to um stop the export of these vaccines uh which which 
which I'm grateful for um, because I've had the Pfizer jab. I'm oh, you had Pfizer? Second, Pfizer one. Um, but I think that, you know, had I been given the chance, I would have, I would have had any of them. Yeah. I think they're all good. Um, we need to just pay attention, really, you know, to, all, to the fact that these were trials that were done and they're not necessarily data in the real world. So we're getting new information from Israel, which has been pretty much the, the you know, in the leader in terms of how many people they're vaccinated. And the, the data there looks really, really good. It does look as though, um, you know, very few people who've had two jabs are being infected. So they're not being just infected and they're not getting the symptoms but it doesn't they've got no data to say whether it's going to transmit so whether we're still going to, be able to uh, transmit the well, just today before i came on ah. um this live chat i was reading if you go on if you go into google now and just just type in or even go to bbc news website you'll probably find that this new study which is going to be published shows that the oxford astrazeneca vaccine reduces infections by 67 ah. percent now, now, if it's true for the way that I'm looking at it, is that if it's true for this One, vaccine, it would be true for all of them. Because they all pretty but, much work in the same way. Yeah, they they work in the way that you need to look at look at it is that modern molecular biology, um, you can send information in an email yeah. and somebody can print the the, the sample. You know oh, what they okay. need on the so other they side. Can print the ingredients of it. Yeah. Pretty much. So the Moderna vaccine probably took about half a day to actually make. So from, from the time the Chinese released the genome for this virus to the time that the Moderna vaccine or these vaccines, the blueprint of them was already made, oh, okay. probably was about half a day to a day. Okay. The problems that you need to take this and, and get it up to scale and mm. all that kind of stuff, all the stuff that we've had to they deal go with. Through the trials. That's more of a thing, and the trials obviously take time. Yeah. But the actual making you can literally do it in half a day. Okay. That's the the power of. What of, are they? Of... We'll probably get too technical. Like, what are they made of? What's going? Because it's not a live vaccine. You're not being injected with COVID. No. It's kind of no. a part of a molecule of COVID to mimic it. Yeah. Let me let me just try and think about how best to phrase it. You you have to get the the bit of the virus which your body so the way covid works um, or the way that it, it gets into your body is by it goes in and it's essentially got these keys on the outside and these keys go into find a cell the keys then let you get into the it gets into the cell via these keys but it's exactly those keys that also all the infection fighting cells recognize so what you want to do what you want to do is present the key to your body without without having the virus to make you get unwell so the trick is how do you take the keys and get them into your body now one group might say well let's just take the keys manufacture the keys and inject them into the body Okay. Another group might say, well, let's take the key, stick it onto a harmless virus, which we can do with genetic engineering and, and you know, everything. Um, get a harmless virus to take it into your body with that particular key. So you take a virus, a normal virus, like something that might just give you a cold. You put the key on top of it um, and then you get the get it inside your inside your body. Um, and then get your body to make the you know make that key effectively yeah the, the spike protein as you say um some of the really advanced um vaccines like the pfizer and the moderna have kind of bypassed that system um of the virus taking you know being used to go into the cell and just have essentially just given a piece of genetic code that doesn't even get to the middle part the nucleus of the cell it just kind of gets the cell to produce the um uh, that particular the spike protein without doing anything else um so it completely bypasses the main way that historically we used to make vaccines am i making sense or is it getting kind of <laughs> kind <laughs> of um one of the questions that's popped up is uh 
um, can we yeah. still be a carrier yeah. uh, after we've had the vaccine? So can we still carry it and transmit? I think I asked that before, can we transmit it? But yeah. do we think that we'll what? still carry it and give it? Well, but if is somebody the... isn't vaccinated, can mm -hmm. somebody who is vaccinated pass it on to somebody who isn't and then they'll get ill? Well, this is exactly the point that I was making. Until about two hours ago, I would have said, um, nobody knows, we don't know. We've got no evidence to show thing because the way that you would know is you would vaccinate people and then you would swab them. You might swab them every day oh, and okay, get results. Yeah. They try, try to figure out, you know, what happens after two weeks? What happens after three weeks? Do they have virus in, the, in, in their nose yeah. and their throats? We just didn't have that data. So now we've but got if, seven odd million people vaccinated. They've obviously be, been put on a system to know when the positive tests come back through, and none well, of them the, have been tested positive. It, this 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 data that I read just now before I came on here, yeah. because I've just become a bit bit um, really nerdy with <laughs> reading papers. Um, if this data is true, and sixty seven percent of people. Um, it reduces transmission by 67%. Um, it means that you, nearly 70% of people will not be able to transmit the virus. So when you read that, being... did you do a little dance? I thought, wow, this is really good. Um, because that's what really going to work. In your nerdy um, doctor way, you went, wow. Yeah, yeah. Whereas a See, normal there, person like me would be like, Ooh. <laughs> We're going on holiday. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's, you know, it's, you know, I, my son was born, um, as I was saying, so I've got two sons, Yash is three, and my, uh, our baby Leo, he's going to, he's four months um, tomorrow. And my mum hasn't seen him. Um, my sister who lives in Uxbridge hasn't seen him. Um, my, you know, my in-laws, my my father-in-law because gosher is polish uh, he hasn't been able to come around we haven't been able to go over there for christmas so it's just i think people's ordinary lives are so interrupted mm. um and you you know you you so I, I i i'm very excited but at the same time you know you have to be a bit kind of cautious wait because for all of us to get vaccinated so do you think we're going to be pretty much in lockdown until every the majority of people are vaccinated or is it just going to be at risk groups they talk they keep talking about the at risk groups i i've if if you my my feeling is and this was my feeling all along was that i think the vaccination will all of a sudden kick in and we will just find that things just start to change very quickly yeah. um and that's that's what my hope is i think i'm really proud of our vaccination effort across the country um i think we're doing a you know we're doing a good job i think people might say you know people might have different political affiliations and everything but i think the way things are going here right now is good um you know we've got a really good kind of national spirit when it comes yeah. to rolling now everybody's making an effort so i'm hopeful that we can actually get this you know rolled out um even even by the end of this month i think we'll be in a different position um and i think that roundabout by june i wouldn't be surprised if we vaccinated every adult in the country by june really those who want yeah. it of course and i roll my eyes yeah. to these of course, of course. damn them yeah yeah i've 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 had i've had my encounters with them and even in hospitals you, you get you get people calling up saying this is a hoax isn't it troubling the receptionists and I saying all of this stuff is, i love the pictures that are taken of hospitals that are empty and you kind of go yeah no shit Sherlock. you're standing in the middle of a corridor if you actually go on the <laughs> ward it's buzzing there's no one yeah. in the corridors because there's no one allowed in the hospital <laughs> yeah it's also the way that strategically how things have worked i mean they've had to reallocate wards um essentially make them covid or not yeah. covid and, and the thing with covid is it's not it's true that some of the concerns that people have they're saying well actually not everybody's um unwell with covid as such i mean somebody comes in and they've got a let's just say that they've they've got a problem with their hip or they've broken their hip they don't have a temperature they don't have anything but they turn out to be covid yeah, positive and this is what's happened to so, my friend's mum so 
so what you do in that situation is you have to isolate them yeah. because they're they're risk it's true that they don't but it's it's really just more of a testament to how how widespread this actually is yeah um, and it's touching and a lot of people, people who are, don't have covid so my mum's have it my mum's obviously got cancer and she's not in a great place and she's losing lots of weight yeah. and she's in lots of pain but i was just talking yeah. to her today and mm -hmm. she says she's dying and she's got it in her mind yeah. that she's dying and she feels rotten and she's got no drive and i and she's losing weight and i said well why are, why aren't you eating so much mum and she says what have I got to eat for? You know, and I said to her, you've mm. got to remember, it's not the cancer that's doing this to you. This is COVID in what it's done to her life. If my mum was mm. seeing her grandchildren and me and yeah. her friends and going out to lunch, she would be pretty normal. She'd probably feel a bit rough, okay. but you know, she's on these chemo drugs. She's not going for chemotherapy treatment. She's on this ongoing drug. So it makes her feel a bit shitty, but she's feeling rubbish and she's virtually dying and losing weight yeah. or thinks that she is because that's all she's got to think about and i said to her I once know. the sun comes out and once you know it's january we all feel crap in january as well I but i yeah. think covid has the, the people will be victims of covid when they haven't even had covid because of you know the mental yeah. health side of things that's true that's true and that's that's the that's the flip side that I, I think um, often I sometimes play devil's advocate. There are a lot of people, even in the medical profession, who will just go on about how lockdown should have happened. Yeah. Have you stopped? Uh, bugger. lost uh, i lost Sachin. what a shame um i'm gonna say goodbye because i think we've been gassing now for an hour and 20 minutes sorry about that Sachin. um but next week i i will try and get Sachin possibly back in just to talk more about certain specific kind of treatments um, but we went off on a tangent there and started talking about A&E and hospitals and things like that, which was really interesting and actually getting his kind of input into COVID and the vaccinations and the importance of it. Um, that was obviously really interesting. But my next live is going to be with a lady called Trisha, who um, she makes and styles and colours wigs for, um, she works and is recommended by the Fountain Centre. Um, my mum actually gets her wigs, um, post chemo wigs from Trisha and she's amazing, but she's actually still working. Um, so I wanted to bring her in as a live just for her to talk about what she's doing at the moment, her um, kind of co what she's doing through the pandemic, but also generally what her business is and all about her wigs and the chemo side. And obviously she works with people with alopecia as well. So it's kind of, it really works in line with my business and my client base. So I thought it'd be really interesting to bring her in, but I am going to say good night. I want to just say, a massive thank you. I wanted to say this to him personally, but um, I think he timed out or his phone must have died or something. I think I killed his phone, bless him. Um, but I wanted to say a massive thank you to Sachin. I've sent out recently some um, skin um, care packages to NHS. Um, and the, I think all of the people who got um, named to receive them were all women. Um, so I didn't send any to any men, um, but one is going to be going to Sachin um, as a thank you from me to him for everything that he's done for all of us. Um, and it's something really close to my heart when it comes to the NHS. Obviously, I'm a walking, talking advocate of the amazing work that the NHS does. Um, and he's, you know, he's a representative of them. He's their frontline. You can't get more frontline 
than A and E. Um, and I've got a few friends who work in A and E, and they're right there. You know, they'll and they'll wave their flag and say, no, 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 we haven't done it. You know, the ITU teams are the ones that are in the thick of it. But actually, they're the ones every day, every night, twenty four seven, which every year, whatever pandemic, A and E get the first, the full brunt of whatever's coming. Um, so I take my hat off to them. They are literally kind of, they're like the army. Um, when you talk frontline, I always imagine them to be in like camo gear um, and they're protecting us. You know, they are the ones that we go to first. So I want to just give a massive shout out to any of the A&E people. Um, and I will catch you all soon. If you've got any questions, as I always say, don't hesitate to drop me a line. Um, any requests for any lives, um, if you want me to cover any topics or subjects, or if you can think of anyone who might want to come on a live with me. Um, I've got a few people lined up who I may be jumping on with, um, but I'm always open for a chat. This is kind of like me on a night out. Um, I put a bit of makeup on and I've had a good old chat with my old mate Sachin. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, wish you all health and um, stay safe and stay home and get your vaccine as soon as you can. I'll see you later, guys.